So tonight, it's a bit of a change from grassroots Cornish football and over around the rest of the country. We have the wonderful Jason from Colonel FA and Kanifa. Uh, a lot of you won't know what that is, and that's why we've got Jason to talk about it. This is a treat and a half for you guys, and I hope you really enjoy it. Jason, welcome to the show. Um, it's amazing that we've managed to get hold of you and get you on. Uh, I knew a little bit about it. Some of the other admins didn't know a lot about it, so it's a big open book for us, and we're just willing to hear the story of it. So Jason it represents the Colonel FA as well as Kenefa. He has a, a big part to do with Kenefa. So to start off with, we'll let Jason just explain what the main objective of Kenefa is and how it all works. Now there's an open question. Um, <laughs> Kanifa, um evening anyway, Jack. Nice to meet you, mate. Thanks for having me on. Uh, That's brilliant. It's great to have um, you on, mate. Yeah. Uh, Kanifa stands for the, the Confederation of Independent Football Associations. Uh, represents about 420 million people now worldwide. Uh, represents peoples, uh, de facto nations, nations, and so on. Uh, Disparities of people all over the world. Uh, it's more about people than um, bordered countries. So, from what I can understand from that, and what I've mean, you've had a chat about, and that that's that's places that have either, like like you said, they could be war torn. It could be countries that just economically don't quite fit into the mould of international football. Uh, but the main thing that really that I like about this whole situation is, like you said, it's about the football, it's about the people, it's about giving them something to look forward to, as well as it is competitive. And don't get me wrong, like, like you just said to me, it is competitive football, but it's for people that wouldn't normally get a chance to show their skills or their abilities on a world stage against some really good teams. It's not They're not like international teams where they're just walkovers. There is some really good standard football going on, isn't there? Oh, that's for sure. If you consider that these people, you know, I mean, and it's more, there's, a, there's, there's the opportunity for the people to represent themselves, uh, which is a key part to Comita. If you imagine, you know, the players that are there to represent their people on, on what is their biggest stage, um, you know, and there's a lot of professional minded people that play the game in and around um, these sort of areas, nations and de facto nations. Uh, but, but some of them have that harder background where they really want to make a point and they've got a lot of heart and belief and they have to really go the extra mile to, to, to help raise their people from some quite deep and dark places. So um, competitive, yes, um, extremely passionate. It's, it's like, like you just said there, it's like a ray of, ray of light really, a shine of light into nations that don't have had, like you said, dark places and dark times in their country. So it gives them an opportunity to show that they're not just known for the bad things, they can be known for great things that can happen. In all honesty, how did you end up getting into this? I, I got in touch with Connie for, in 2017. I was running a um, the country's only independent freestyle football event at the time. I've been a grassroots coach for over a decade at this point, but was also banging freestyle football, which was still one of my oldest sons. And um, Andrew Bragg, co-founder of Colonel FA, introduced me to Tommy Day. His son was playing in North Sweden, and I've been playing with one of the Stampney players. Uh, Stampney people, the reindeer people of the tundra, and the first ever Conifer World Cup was held there and, and put on by those people, uh, Harkin and Per Landers, Harkin, Korak and uh, Per Landers, who's now president. And um, um, as um, Josh had come back, I was chatting to Andrew Bragg, Andrew Bragg's been involved in Cornish football and football all his life, he's 58 now. He, he played from being seven years old, chairman, coach, all the way through his son. Um, had a couple of brief spells at Plymouth uh, through their youth system, through the academy. And um, ended up in North Sweden, got talking to some of the Santa people. One of the Santa people players was saying to Josh, oh, we play in an international football setup. We play for the Santa people. And Josh is like, well, what are you talking about? I've never heard of it. And... And he got talking, and then Josh gets on the phone to Andrew, 
And it's like, I think Cornwall could have an international team. And <laughs> Andrew Braggy looked into it because um, their Cornish race, as it is, you know, they've got their own language, they've been identified by uh, the United Nations and, and the EU, that uh, they are a race for their own people. They all have to qualify to represent themselves in Conita. So Andrew Bragg has got in touch with me to see about setting something up, but it just wasn't quite the right time. It was too big of a deal. I was on with what I was on with, he was on with what he was on. But I got, we introduced ourselves to Conita, and I stayed with them, thinking that I could get the freestyle football event onto a world stage. So I was, I was hoping to get it affiliated with someone with the right ethic. And, and push on. And I stayed in touch with them. And through the summer, they had the Euros on in Northern Cyprus, and I followed them. And then it came to August, and they had announced that they were going to do a World Cup in 2018 in London. So I just got back in touch with Per Anders, the president, saying I'd love to be, I'd love it at the freestyle event to come and be a part of the World Cup. Uh, we got talking. And after about three weeks of conversations and going through the motion, he just said, would you join Conifa? Would you help us put a World Cup on? We need someone with uh, your sort of business acumen and energy and drive. And I was thinking, wow, really? And I just thought, there's no way I'm, there's no way I'm giving this up. And I just absolutely, I just said 100%. I literally bounced from room to room. And um, when I put the phone down, and... Uh, and just cracked on really. I think the first thing I did is, in the first few months is I spoke to every football club in and inside the M25 and right up to um, probably within a 30 mile radius of the M25 trying to get people to listen, open up the ground for games and, and sort of work it all out and that's pretty much how it started. By, ja by January, I, uh, I got voted in as a global business director at the AGM. And it sort of snowballed from there, mate. Yeah. Well, that, that is... Yeah. That, that, to be honest, that is a hell of a story. I'm sure it could go a lot longer with exactly what you've done since you've been a part of it. Um, for people, that, yeah. for people in, a, in a short 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 term, should I say, what would, yeah. what would happen if you got the kind of recognition and the global and the media reaction that that a FIFA World Cup would get. Would that would that just change things altogether for Geneva? Would that make make it like a more interest but not interesting, more more it more international clubs would get involved and stuff like that? Well, it's tough. I mean, to be fair we don't we're not doing bad, you know, we've got uh, fifty seven members and yeah and we're representing you know, six of the Earth's population. So we're not doing too bad, but you know, the money and the power that is that is within FIFA has, has been something that's been built over up over over 120 years. You know, so yeah. it, it, it's impossible to compare something that got started in um, uh, 2013. To something that's been going on as long and as well built up as it is. It's fair yeah. I feel that um, I feel that for what we're doing, we're doing well, and, and all we need to do is focus on making sure why we're doing it, and and, and we continue along those yeah. lines. You know, and it's so the ethical, it's the ethical feeling of it, isn't it? How well we're doing. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the ethical bit. It's the ethical bit behind it. It's uh, what you're doing it for, not so much what you get out of it. It's what you're putting into it and the the feeling you get from it and the proudness and when you can sit there and kind of go, do you know what? We've put on a World Cup for Geneva. We've put a World Cup on for teams well, that well, wouldn't well. normally get this kind of stage to play on and they're playing against some some really good footballing teams. So for you, it's for you and probably a lot of the members of Geneva, it's kind of one of the things is we've done that kind of we've worked. We've had all the teams behind us. We've done we've worked tirelessly. By the way, voluntary. This is this is a big thing as well. These guys ain't getting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds to sit on a board. They're putting their time, their effort, and their passion into something they really enjoy doing. Which for me is what grassroots football is about. It's what all football should be about. Fair enough. There's a lot of money floating around, but end of the day, when it comes down to football, if you don't love it, 
and you're just doing it for money, you shouldn't be doing it at all, in my opinion. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's one thing they're doing. They're doing well football. It's all about the football. <laughs> they do, we really do. Um, so, yeah, so, obviously... So, you know, carry on. <laughs> no, no, please. No, please. No, you, you go, man. Um, so obviously you do Kenefa and you do the Colonel FA, uh, but I was talking to you and you said about grassroots and you, you coach quite a lot. Um, I'm guessing that was in Cornwall as well. Um, when you were coaching at grassroots, could you, what you see now and hear of now compared to when you were doing it, has it changed a lot? Um, sort of how, how do you mean? So, as had, can you see the development of football in Cornwall in general with your Colonel FA and what's hearing about grassroots and teams developing and youth players? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think um, um, what gets overlooked in Cornwall actually is an amazing football in infrastructure. Uh, and Cornwall FA, they run that. They they do phenomenal work. But you know, in and around the clubs, you you know the the clubs there's a lot of clubs getting well run. And there's a lot of coaches just like me putting time in on the ground day in, day out, you know. And it's easy when the sun's shining, but as you know, you get to February and it's, um, the rain's been horizontal for three months and the wind's been blowing. And you can, go out, you can go out onto a football pitch and you can just feel the energy around the place and everyone's turned up. Our coaches haven't even been on for the tea yet. Uh, players, you know, they might have just been able to get on, get some tea, get some football. Uh, but I feel that um, there's some phenomenal work that goes on um, on the ground on a daily day, on a daily basis. So um, I feel that um, all I ever really wanted to do is add something to that by which the whole game benefits. You know, so you know you, you deal with one player at a time, but sometimes you get a chance to look outside and do something a little bit bigger. Um, but you know, we, we always stay in line with the FA. We work together um, as best we can. You know, because they love what we do, we love what they do. But unfortunately for um, the FA, they're not allowed to do sort of work with Conita. So the best thing that um, you know, Don Aberdeen, the CEO there, and, um, and uh, a few of the other the head on shows, it's just like, you know, what we'll, we'll, we'll leave you alone. And you just carry on, and, and, and that was literally the best thing that they could do, and, and it really worked. So there's, there's, yeah. there's phenomenal effort being put in all, all the time. And you can you can see that. Obviously, when I spoke to you on the phone, and obviously I spoke to Kaga as well, it was just nice to see the passion and the belief in something that, like you said, started not so long ago, and it it, it started <laughs> small, and like you said, now you're representing. A majority of the of the globe really you've got teams from all over the place yeah. um and for me to hear that from somebody that's not gone in and is getting all this money it's somebody that's generally gone i love football i love everything about football you love cornwall as well obviously you love cornwall to pieces yeah. and you just want everybody to be able to have the right opportunity and the same amount of chance to prove that football is not just about Premier League stars. It is about the ins and the outs, the forty to sixty hour people that are putting them in free of charge and doing something great for football. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. And that and, and that is all it's about. You know, but um with Colonel F A, uh with there being no sort of senior representative side for over a decade, uh, for for one reason or another. And and then with no geo graphically how hard it is for players to get out of the county to um, to get to any sort of professional outfit. Uh, you know, the, the strains on, on parents and then it's whether you've been picked up and all these all these tough things, you know, it leaves it, leaves it a look, geographically it's capped. So the idea is that we'll put something in that gives you the opportunity to get outside that bubble, you know, gives the chance to swim out to some international yeah. waters and fight a few sharks and come on big question. The response was phenomenal. Really yeah. 
Big question for you. Do you have a lot of the nations asking you to take some Cornish passes over for them so they can have them a try? Yeah. And, um, yeah. Uh, one guy in particular, but he actually they came down from London, Chagos Island, and um, it's a dysphoria of uh, Chagos. They got removed from their island in the Indian Ocean in the 60s, and they've been fighting to go back ever since. But they came down for a game, and we introduced them to Cornish pasties, and they didn't and Cornish pasties on a weekly basis. They're, they're, they're technically <laughs> that um, uh, Hi, Jay, hope you're well. Still haven't got the Cornish pasties. And Jimmy, the manager of them, in the proper football boy, is um, unfortunately in a pretty severe car accident last week. And, um, and I actually kept him up telling him I'll send him some kind of passes. Of <laughs> <laughs> the, healing pow- the, the healing power of a pasty. Um, so we've had a few comments. We've had oh, Mitch, God. who's one of the admins, that said, this is a brilliant mate, great inside, very interesting. Uh, I don't know who that was. They put double boom. Um, Dave as well, Dave's put a great video, great insight, um, quick question, how does an outsider get involved in Kinefa uh, or representing teams like for the Colonel FA or stuff like that? Well, um, there's, a, there's a criteria you need to meet, you know, you can look it up on the website and, um, you know, membership application. It, it comes down to a few key points really, you know, that as, as a people, are you, who are you representing? Um, you know, is there, a, is there a sort of language in there? Are you actually just a bona fide country? You know, it might be that you know, yeah. just get applicants from countries that just want to uh, get off, off the ground. Islands, small island nations, especially like out in the Gilbert Islands, so we've got uh, Tuvalu and Kiribati. Um, so, and then really, you know, you sort of go through a process by which um, you sort of fill out these sort of forms. Um, you go through the Continental President. And uh, uh, the, what we've set up is that Continental President will work with you from first contact to find out if there's a way that it's possible for you to join and what you're going to need to do and sort of hold your hand through that. And then yeah. that then gets passed over to the Global Executive Committee, um, which is normally made up of 12 to 6 participants at any one time from all over the world and they'll take a vote but you know what with the sort of process that we've put in place um, it usually means it's ready for the votes that then from that from that vote with the executive committee it's approved and it goes to a member's vote at the AGM uh, which is yeah. always held in January somewhere around the world so, so. Um, you know that it's, um, it's quite a process, but then, you know, defining and holding down these things is, is, is a lovely process. It just takes hard work. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've got so many questions, but we've got a, we have like a time limit on these interviews just because uh, we don't want to do it too much. Um, we will have you and Jason, uh, you and Braggy on when you're both free at the That's same good. time. It would be interesting to have you both on That's because good. I know you two yeah. are probably about... Bounce off, bounce over, off each other, which would be great to see. Yeah, um, he's um, he's larger than life, is Mr. Brad, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, so, for me to finish on, we do this with every person. Um, if you look at this season and obviously what's happened with COVID over the last few months and how difficult it's been for grassroots to get yourself back off the ground, is it gonna yeah. is it gonna cause you a bit more difficulty because obviously it's international waters and teams. Or, or are you looking to get the games started again and going as soon as you possibly can and as soon as they're physically possible? Well, um, yeah, I mean, who doesn't want the football back on, you know? I mean, there's, there's, I mean, a lot of the teams are back out there now, sort of training, gearing up, getting ready. I've, I've just, I've dropped in with uh, new key reserves a couple of times, that's where my oldest two are that. But from um, Kern OFA's perspective, because we work, alongside the FA as much as possible. We try not to put games on during the domestic season. So yeah. we did try and open up the idea of having a game pre-season, but it, it just wasn't working out. And uh, we we're, were prepared to go and travel and get a game and such like. Uh, Jersey offered us a game. Uh, Chagos Island offered us a game up in London. But it just wasn't going to work out. So we just got to let it be and work on, every, you know, work on other matters. You know, you've got to take the opportunity that it gives you. Rather than, to um, build, to build on other stuff that's probably been well put me, to know. the back. Probably work on stuff that's been probably been put on the back burner yeah. for a little while because you've been so busy doing other stuff. 
Well, there is a little bit of that. And plus, clubs have got their own issues, and and, and the players that are in Cano Affair, they like, you know, they're in these clubs with the best players, and we don't want them in the way of some serious preparation that's already hindered. You know, we would rather just step back and be planning for the European Championships next year. You know, Cano Affair's perspective. Um, from Conita's perspective, again, you know, trying to take the opportunity. So we are put in um, a bit of a new structure and we've attracted some fantastic people and we've been getting them better in, you know, new media managers, um, new directors, new continental presidents, um, new teams, launched a new league in Mexico. Um, we're looking to roll out um, a global business initiative, which is like a, an engagement toolkit. So we're going to be working yeah. closely with members and offering support to members so that they can really start to hone their business acumen and attributes and strengthen up their partnerships um, with stakeholders, government officials, such like, um, and getting in around them and sort of work closer together to make sure that, one, we're doing all that we can and that we're ready for when things do open up. You know, we're looking... So and we're looking for this to have an effect. So in two years' time, they might be um, uh, they might be financially better off, which means they can get some more tournaments and, um, and get better exposure. Um, just part of what we're putting together, really. So we're, we're, just, we're just working as hard as we can in the areas that we can. It's nice to hear. Um, this won't be the last time we hear from you. We'll get you a, you a braggy on. We'll have you on throughout the season. Everybody that's come on so far, it's been lovely chatting to them. So what I'm going to be doing is just like every month or every couple of months, we'll have a refresh, we'll have a chat, see what's gone on in them few months. Um, it has honestly been a pleasure to have you on. And I really, really hope that a lot of people will see this video and they get an insight into exactly how much work gets put into it. Before we go, was there anybody you want to give some special mentions to? Um, have we got three hours? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd, I'd, I'd just like to uh, thank everyone that uh, that sort of knows me, that work, we work together on. You know, you know, got Raggy. I'll, I'll have to chuck my wife in there because she, you know, she has a lot of patience. Let me crack on with all this sort of stuff. Yeah, um, I bet. <laughs> any, any coaches, all the setups, you know, say anyone in Conita, any of the teams. I mean, I'm going out to Abkhazia next month and meet the president of the country and all these sort of beautiful notions. Anyone in football, anyone that is now thinking, should I go back, should I bother? Go back. Bother. If you can't get to a team, get the ball out, get on top of your feet and just be ready. Be ready for the right opportunity. And, and you know, put some effort in. Get the energy right. You know. We can't just sit back and just take it. You know, the game's got to go on. Literally just had the most inspirational little rant there that I've had on any of these videos. Literally, like, that is exactly my opinion on it. We can't be beaten by something. We've got to keep playing. We've got to keep... The game's got to stay alive because if it doesn't stay alive, a lot of people don't have something to look forward to. And I'm not just talking about people in the UK. I'm talking about people all over the world. There's a lot of people that only get an hour or two hours of kicking a ball around the field to escape things that they want to just go and enjoy themselves for a couple of hours. So exactly. I appreciate everything you exactly. do. And I know a lot of the lads that have been watching this and comment on this will honestly take their hat off to you because you not just you but Kanifa in general and Braggy and the Kano FA and, and your wife for putting up with all the uh, 40 to 60 hours free working you've been doing um, it's been lovely having you on Jason I can't wait to get you and Braggy on again it'll be a great little chat we'll have this has been the Armchair Pundits this is Jason Heaton part of the Kano FA and Kanifa what a legend it's been great having him on thank you for tuning in and watching don't for, don't forget to like, comment, and share. Get it. Get your friends involved. The, everything about this armchair pundits is about the fans and about the effect of football that it has on everybody. So you enjoy the rest of your Tuesday evening. I'll be back tomorrow night with a couple of more interviews. Jason, it's been an absolute pleasure, my friend. Hey, Jack, I love it, mate. Take care, and I look forward to coming back on. Thank you. Lovely stuff.